Hello, and welcome to the first in a series of tutorials called Inside the Mind. This series is an exploration of the intricacies of various artists' workflows, and I get to be the first victim. I'm Xavier Quayle Quistalny. In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of my approach to stylized art while I walk you through the creation of an original hip-hop styled character named Swagnificent. Throughout this video, I'll be showing time-lapse footage of my work along with real-time sections devoted to various aspects of the tools I use. These include ZBrush for sculpting, Modo for modeling, retopology, and UV mapping, Nald for baking, and Photoshop for texturing. The character I've made for this tutorial was built from the ground up to showcase Marmoset Toolbag 2's physically-based rendering pipeline for use in displaying stylized characters. While a lot of people tend to assume that physically-based rendering is primarily for realistic subjects, it's actually more of a holistic approach to shading that emphasizes using consistent values and material settings to achieve a unified art style. While this does lend itself to replicating real-world materials, it's actually just as useful for creating stylized art. For most of my personal work, I don't start with concept art. Instead, I generally like to begin with a simple idea and jump straight into sculpting. If necessary, I may take screenshots and do paint overs for myself later on. Starting work as a concept sculpt lets me make large changes very quickly, and also gives me a very good idea of whether a design I had in mind will actually work in 3D. If I have a specific idea for a character, or an aspect of that character, I usually write it down in detail so that I can refer to it later on if I get off track or just forget what I was working on. In addition to writing down ideas for physical aspects of characters, I also like to note ideas for materials I'd like to represent, lighting setups I might like to use, and parts of the workflow that may present problems in the future. For this project, my goal was to make a pop slash hip hop musician with really bold colors and strong shapes. Because I had a pretty good idea for the character from the start, I was able to collect a lot of references of various rappers with extravagant styles that would allow me to kind of stylize and interpret them in a cartoony way. When I have all my notes together, I finally start sculpting, and I usually start with a head or bust. Starting with a bust lets me get a good feel for the attitude of the character, and start building shape language that will carry through to the rest of the design. In this case, I started the head sculpt using Zebro's base head mesh, though any basic head mesh or even simple primitive would work just fine. In addition to using Zebro's base head mesh, I also use Z-spheres to start blocking out the body. As I block out characters, I'll often make extensive use of DynaMesh and Z-Remesher to ensure that I have polygon distribution that's much more consistent than Z-spheres will initially give. I use Z-Remesher later on extensively with the high-poly clothing models. When I have a good base to start retopo for the high poly, I like to bring it into Modo and rescale everything to the proper size so that it will work well with Marmoset Toolbag 2's shaders and lighting. Here I'm using the absolute scaling tools in Modo to resize the base model to about 1.7 meters high. With the high poly base rescaled properly, I then like to make sure that it's completely symmetrical, so I'll cut down the center, delete everything on one side of that cut, and then mirror it. This will ensure that it plays well with the retopology tools in Modo when I have symmetry turned on. Modo has some really excellent retopology tools, as well as an entire interface layout devoted exclusively to retopo. After using the pen tool to lay out some basic geometry on a new layer, you can then start extruding geometry across the surface using the topology pen by holding shift while you click and drag. You can even extrude an entire loop by holding shift and clicking with the right mouse button. One of Modo's most useful retopo tools is the bridge tool with the auto connection setting selected. By selecting edges that are adjacent to edges connected by topology, an automatic connection can be made using the same number of edge loops as the adjacent connected edges. This makes it pretty simple to cover large areas with basic topology. One of the techniques I like to use when doing retopo is making sure that I use polygons and edges in multiples of two. For example, I'll use an 8, 16, or 32-sided cylinder for something like an arm or leg. Using multiples of two keeps geometry very consistent, and ensures that some parts of the high-poly model can be easily repurposed as low-poly models. If I used loops with inconsistent numbers of polygons, going from the high-poly to low-poly would be significantly more difficult and time-consuming. 
With the retopo for the head and body done, I move on to building some basic clothing in Marvelous Designer. I'll eventually be re-sculpting in ZBrush, but starting in Marvelous gives me a really good base to work from. I use symmetry on the basic patterns, and use fabric settings that create large, thick folds that will be easy to sculpt and clean up later on. If a certain piece of clothing starts sliding around, I'll increase the amount of friction in its fabric settings so it stays in place. For cuffs and collars, I use very stiff fabric settings so that they retain their shapes very well. When a piece of clothing is shaped how I like, I'll freeze it so it retains its shape, and other pieces around it are forced to conform to it. When I'm finished with a piece of clothing in Marvelous Designer, I'll export it as an OBJ and then import it into ZBrush. There are a number of ways I can clean it up and make it usable. In general, I like to extract the individual panels so they have thickness, and then Z-remesh those pieces so they have more useful topology. Depending upon the complexity of the design, I may reproject details from the original clothing piece. Now that I have the jacket and shirt imported into ZBrush, I start putting together pants using Marvelous Designer. I then apply the same extraction and Z-remeshing process to make them easier to work with. With the clothing now blocked out, I move on to retopologizing the hat, creating the hands, and doing a bit of cleanup on the clothing. To get the initial base mesh for the hands, I use the hands from Arsh Levin's base male mesh. I could block these out on my own, but this is as fast and easy. I use this to figure out the shapes of the hand as well as the size and positioning before I start retopo. With the hands blocked out, I take them back to Moto for proper retopology. I use the same retopo tools as before for a single finger, and then I duplicate and rescale that chunk for the remaining fingers. Once the fingers are in place, I connect them with a loop that will allow me to make a very easy UV split along the center line of the entire hand. From there, I use tools like Edge Extend to add more polygons, Loop Slice to add contiguous loops, and Element Move with various falloffs to move vertices, edges, and polygons until I am happy with the final shape of the hand. With the initial shapes of the clothing in place, I need to think about how I'm going to deal with potential problem areas. I like to cap the ends of sleeves so that I can sculpt them as solid shapes instead of thin panels. This way I don't have to worry about sculpting back faces or having potential overlaps. I'll eventually do this with the pants as well. Now that everything's blocked in, I'm ready for the final clothing pass. First I use Dynamesh and Z-Remesher to cap the holes in the pants, and then I move on to sculpting primarily with Trim Dynamic and Damn Standard. The goal is to create a stylized look using the initial Marvelous Designer base as a guide for fold placement. Using Dam Standard allows me to add sharp creases and edges to various areas, and Trim Dynamic allows me to flatten areas that I don't want to be curved or bumpy. You can see the effects of these in the folds and wrinkles of the pants. Areas that would usually have gradual curves have much sharper shapes after I've sculpted them. With the majority of the sculpting finished, I take some time to do some poly painting on the skin. I start poly paint with a dark base and lay in color zones for the face. The color zones are based on a number of things, including places where blood vessels are close to the surface of the skin, as well as thickness of skin and facial hair. Male characters often have a blue-gray tone along their jawline, consistent with a beard. The cheeks, nose, and ears are often the reddest parts of the face. The forehead usually has a lighter yellowish tone. By laying down these colors and then painting over them lightly, you can achieve very believable flesh tones very easily. When I poly paint, I often have a hard time getting the right colors in the cracks and crevices of a model. If this happens, I usually switch to the Trim Dynamic brush and set it to RGB so I can paint with it. I then turn off Z Add or Z Sub, whichever is selected, and then by holding Alt and painting strokes, I can paint in the crevices of a model without having to worry about being 100% accurate with my brush placement. When I'm feeling comfortable with the state of the poly paint, I like to drop the high poly into tool bag and get an idea of how my final materials will look. Despite being primarily for game art, tool bag is very capable when it comes to loading high poly meshes and can easily import multi-million poly models with very little slowdown. By assigning a material with vertex colors selected in the albedo slot, I can get a very good idea of how the final model will look. Note that I'm most likely going to want to turn on sRGB all the time, or the colors will look pretty washed out. 
In addition to turning on vertex colors, I fiddle with the gloss and assign a skin shader to start getting a good idea of what settings I'm going to use. The skin shader has various options for making materials that are translucent and fleshy, including options for blurring shadows and ambient inclusion, and adding a translucency term that's affected by both direct lighting as well as the environment. If I'm ever unsure about what material I want to use for a specific part of the final model, I'll usually load the high poly into toolbag and play with shaders until I feel confident moving forward with it. It's now time to finish the high poly model. Here I start modeling the hair using curved tubes and ZBrush, and I start modeling the sunglasses, finalizing the cuffs and collar, making a mouth sock instead of teeth, and working on other accessories. Using the curved tubes brush allows me to create dreadlock style hair that follows any contour I'd like by simply drawing a stroke. I use these as a basis for the low poly hair later on. I want a large, chunky neck chain for this character, but manually placing chain links is a bit of a pain because of how they interact with each other. To avoid taking time placing links, I'll instead run a simple dynamic simulation in Modo. To construct the chain, I first make a single link at the correct scale relative to the body, and then I make sure that this link is centered at the origin so that I can duplicate it and transform it in a predictable way for the other links. From here, I duplicate the layer with the initial link and start placing the link layers in a rough shape around his neck. I use item selection for this so that I can easily undo any transformations in the transform dropdown for the mesh properties. With the links placed, I then select them all and go to the Setup tab and hit Active Rigid Body. This turns all the links into models that will be affected by physics and, well, by each other. I also select the body model and turn it into a static rigid body. This makes the body model into a simple collider that the chain will then drape over. If I run the simulation right now, the links will just explode outwards because the collision properties aren't set up properly. To get proper collisions, I select everything and go to Dynamic Collision and set their collision shape to Mesh. This uses the actual meshes for collision detection instead of something like a bounding box. In addition, I'll change the margin to a very low value and the mass for the links to a low weight using local mass. Using a low margin will make it so collisions are a lot more accurate, and low weight will let them drape around the model nicely without excessive sliding. From this point, I just hit the Compute button and let it simulate up to around frame 30 or so. This gives it time to settle the links in position, and it gives me some leeway so I can select a frame that looks good later on. With all the links now placed in proper positions, I select the geometry, copy it all to a new file, and save it. This removes any animation frames and freezes them all in position, and this allows me to re-simulate them in the original file if it's necessary. To create the pair for his neck chain, I modeled a simple pear shape and a bite model that I'll boolean out of the main pear mesh. This is a pretty standard boolean modeling operation that subtracts the bite shape from the pear. Once the bite has been booleaned, I clean up around the edges, use Catmull Clark subdivision with weighted edges to get nice shapes, and just put it into position. With the high poly model now finished, it's time to move on to low poly retopo, and the first step of that is staying organized. Before exporting any high poly models to Retopo, I always try to organize and name my subtools so that they have clear and consistent names. From there, I export them at a medium subdivision level and try to use a consistent naming convention in an organized folder structure. I export all the subtools with their proper names and med underscore prepended so I can easily search for them. When it comes time to bake textures, I use the same naming convention with high and low prepended for the respective chunks of the exploded model. With all the subtools exported at medium detail, I import them into Modo to begin Retopo. I use all the same tools for this step that I did in the high poly Retopo steps, so there's not really anything new here. As you can see from a couple of sections of this model, using very clean topology in my high poly has made it possible to repurpose that geometry for the low poly. This is most visible in areas of the head and hands that use exactly the same topology except with a few edge loops removed or collapsed. In other areas where I wasn't able to use the high poly geometry, I've made sure that there are ample polygons so that areas like joints will deform very well. Lastly, I've tried to arrange some of the geometry so that it will be easier to UV map 
This mostly consists of putting edges in areas that will allow me to have hidden UV seams. Now that the low poly is done, it's time for UVs. Because this is a pretty high-end model, I'll be using four UV sets. One for the head, one for the eyes, one for the hair, and one for the body. Multiple UV sets allow me to organize and iterate on my textures without worrying about unexpected changes to one area of the model or another. For complex parts like the hands, I use Moto's Interactive Conformal UV Relax Mode. This lets me pin vertices in place so the rest of the model can be relaxed around them. Pinning is useful for things like fingers that have a tendency to unwrap badly using fully automated solutions. For parts like the belt that consist of rectangles arranged in a grid-like pattern, rectangle spread is very helpful and includes options for using average sizes as well as packing multiple rectangular UV islands very tightly. I usually let I pack that do most of my UV packing for me. Before exporting to use iPack that, I make sure that all my UV islands are sized correctly relative to one another. This usually just consists of making sure that things you're probably never going to see, like the caps for the insides of sleeves, don't take up much room so the rest of the UVs can use as much texture resolution as possible. Once all the UV islands are at the correct size, I import the model into iPack that and let it work its magic. When trying different settings in iPack that, the most important one is margin size. This is the minimum number of pixels that must be present between two adjacent UV islands in the final pack. The default for a 2048 by 2048 texture is 16 pixels. This is usually enough to account for any mip mapping issues that may crop up when displaying your textures. I pack that may slow down if a large number of settings are checked or modified, so settings require some tweaking on a model by model basis. After letting I pack that run through a few iterations, Here's the final result. Because some areas of my model have pretty nasty overlaps that won't play well with the way I plan to bake textures, I explode my models in Modo. I explode models in very regular increments so that I can always easily align the high and low poly models in case of an accidental slip up. In this case, I move each chunk of the high and low poly in increments of 2 meters away from the origin. After exploding the models, I make sure each major chunk is on a separate, properly named layer in Modo. Then I select them all, right click, and hit Export Selected Layers. This spits out separate files using the names of the layers. Once the models are exported, I select all the layers, make sure the UV set is selected, and then I go to Texture, Export UVs to EPS. This lets me export the UVs in a vector format that I can later import into Photoshop when I'm working on my textures. This is very useful for making selections based on UV islands. With my high and low poly models fully exported, it's time to bake textures in Nald. I like to bake each chunk of the model separately in case there are isolated problems. And this also lets me easily composite textures in Photoshop using separate layers and efficient masking. For this character, I'm going to be baking several different map types, including ambient occlusion, tangent space normals, vertex colors, and transmission. Nald is capable of baking curvature maps, and I'll be baking those as well. It can bake curves and cavities as either separate files or as color channels of a single image. I always have them composited as a single file because it lets me more easily work with them in Photoshop. The default option for cavity maps in Nald is grayscale, and that can present some problems when compositing, so I always use an RGB image if possible. When baking textures, I try to use a naming convention similar to the one I use for the models. Nald is pretty smart about appending map types to the end of file names, so I use the names of the different subtools I'm baking from and let Nald do the rest of the naming work. When importing into Nald, the initial load time may be a bit long with very high poly models, but subsequent bakes should be extremely quick or even instantaneous. Here I'm adjusting the cage after an initial bake so that there are no missed raycasts in the final bake. In general, I try to keep my cage as close as possible to the high poly, and then use a very high range to make sure that there are no missed areas. One of the things I like to include in final textures for a lot of my characters is a nice gradient that draws the eye to the face and upper torso. Rather than manually painting it, I achieve this by using a planar UV map of my model, applying a gradient to it, and baking that 
to the primary UV set. You can see the results of that here. With all the bakes now finished, I composite them in Photoshop. This is fairly simple. By using the command at File, Scripts, Load Files in the Stack, I can select a large number of different textures, load them as individual layers, and start compositing them. If I have more complex textures, like normal maps, I can use the alpha channels automatically included with nulled bakes to select the appropriate areas and then copy and paste. Now that I have ambient occlusion, cavity, and a few other types of maps all composited together, I can load them as layers into a single Photoshop file and start creating my color texture. The color texture will be the basis for my gloss, metalness, and a few other types of textures that I'll load in a Marmoset tool bag. To achieve the kinds of color transitions I'm interested in, I use selections based on the UV texture I exported from Moto to create masks for gradient map layers. These let me select the entire spectrum of colors that can be applied to an area of the color map. They're very quick and easy to adjust for making global changes to color schemes. By doing grayscale paint overs of whatever is underneath them, I can also manually control what the shading looks like in any given area. Now that I have a normal map, ambient occlusion map, and color map, it's time to start doing some work in Marmoset Toolbag to bring out some material definition. Since I have color maps for the head and body, I can now start to use those as bases for gloss, metalness, fuzz, cavity, and other map types. I'm using the skin and microfiber diffusion models in Toolbag. I like to tweak settings until they look right under as many lighting conditions as possible, so I change up lighting and environments pretty often. After a lot of edits and tests and tweaking, I've arrived at some final materials. This is a pretty big jump, so I'll give a breakdown of the types of maps and materials I'm using. Marmoset Toolbag 2 does a very good job of providing tools to set up fairly complex shaders very quickly, especially in regards to shaders for character art. In this case, I'm using the skin and microfiber diffusion models to get believable, if not 100% accurate, material definition for this character. For the skin, I've baked the poly paint and did a small amount of cleanup in Photoshop, but the majority of the work really comes from the application of shaders. Here, I've used the skin color texture for both albedo and subdermis. This gives the skin a nice depth of color and some simulated subsurface scattering. I always like to keep the normal smoothing, shadow blur, and occlusion blur very low on my characters, otherwise a lot of detail gets lost in some of the cracks and crevices of the model. I baked a transmission map out of Nald, and I've plugged it into the translucency map slot. This map defines how much of the translucency effect is visible in the skin shader. Using too much translucency tends to make surfaces look like wax or plastic, so I make sure to dial both the translucency and sky translucency back quite a bit. I only use a little fuzz on the skin to bring out the shape of the surface, but I use it extensively elsewhere. Rather than using specular or metalness map for the skin, I instead use a constant specular value of 0.028. This is based on some specular value measurements found in Sebastian Lagarde's blog post, Feeding a Physically Based Shading Model. While it's a subtle difference from the 0.04 value used in areas with a metalness map, it lends just a touch of authenticity when looking closely at the skin. For the clothing, I use the Microfiber Diffusion Model to add some Fresnel reflection around the edges. This simulates the fuzz you might see on fabric and the way that it catches light at glancing angles. I use a fuzz map I generated in Photoshop from the Albedo map with colors based on the underlying fabric colors. This lets me have various colors of fuzz instead of the single uniform color you'd get from using the shader on its own. One important item to note when working with shaders in Toolbag is that it supports both the Blin Fong reflection model as well as the GGX reflection model. Blin Fong is very fast, but its gloss curve can lead to some very plastic looking materials. Because of this, I much prefer the GGX reflection model. It allows better granular control over gloss values, and I believe it just generally gives a much more pleasing look to most materials. After a lot of tweaking, testing, and going back and forth, I finally got the textures and materials to a place where I'm pretty happy with them. In addition, I've posed the character using some of the basic transform tools in Moto, and I put together a fairly simple lighting setup to try and accentuate his attitude. As a final touch, I threw together a quick texture for a floor and created a very basic low-poly microphone for him to hold. 
For this project, I wanted to light the character so that he looks a bit like he's on stage at a concert. Because of this, I decided to go with a very high contrast lighting setup that gives the feel of a spotlight and some bright stage lights off to the sides. To achieve that look, I first added a bright key light with a bluish tint to it. This gives a good approximation of how a spotlight may look. From there, I added rim lights on either side. For these, I used one with a blue tint and one with a warmer tint to add a slight amount of color variation so that the lighting doesn't feel flat. These rim lights pick up highlights around the edges of the character to give him a bit more depth and pop him out from the background. Finally, I added a fill light to tone down a few of the darker, harsher shadows and bring a bit more warmth to what was otherwise a pretty cool lighting setup. As a couple of final touches, I increased the strength of the lens flare setting and cranked up the brightness of the bloom post effect. Rendering characters in an appealing way can be pretty difficult. That said, a good rule of thumb is that portraits generally look best when they have a narrow field of view, and action shots often look good when they have a wide field of view. Because I want this character to look like he's in the middle of a concert, I've decided to go with a wider field of view that slightly exaggerates his pose and gives the feeling of an action shot. While I don't have much depth of field in this shot, it's essential to simulating a realistic camera in most situations. When using depth of field, don't forget to play with aperture shapes to replicate the bokeh effect you get from certain cameras. If you want to focus on an area in your scene while you're using depth of field, just middle click on it. If you're using things like depth of field, it may also be a good idea to use chromatic aberration in your renders. While it should be used sparingly, it can add significant realism and believability to a scene if it isn't overused. An easy way to use chromatic aberration in Toolbag is to crank the setting up to the maximum, and then adjust individual color channels so that they match photos. Finally, one of the most important aspects of getting good renders out of Toolbag is to take advantage of tone mapping. There are a few options here, though I tend to like the filmic setting. It gives a nice amount of saturation to dark colors. It's very difficult to get with linear or Reinhard tone mapping. If you want to show people your tool bag work in an interactive format, then you should definitely look into Marmoset Viewer to display stuff on the internet. While some of the more GPU intensive effects like screen space reflections and depth of field aren't currently supported, it provides a fantastic way for people to view your work from all angles. Thanks for watching. I'm Xavier Quelo Castani. You can check out my website to see more examples of my personal and professional work. And don't forget to visit Marmoset's site for more tutorials and information about their tools.